urgent cancel culture and free speech oh, the judges get charged this one is a little interesting well they're all interesting all of of my little things that i do here are interesting otherwise i wouldn't choose them i wouldn't do them i'm a solid human being and i love you guys i do this for you all right, cancel culture and free speech are taking a step into the judges' chambers as Z as Connecticut judges ponder the ramifications of injecting social justice, moral constructs into their ethics board's considerations. However, some of these moral assumptions would uh, could violate the sacred preservation of free thought even for government officials, even for judges, so long as their beliefs, values are not reflected as their source of adjudication. So this is from pentoday.com. Although the term cancel culture is contemporary, Sigil Ben Porath, a professor in the Graduate School of Education and an associate member of the Political Science and Philosophy Department, says the attitudes behind it are not. She says the term cancel culture is being widely used today to refer to what previously was called politically correct or safe spaces. Space spaces. It's basically a version of the same cultural ideological argument that we've been seeing for a long time now, she says. The term, or how widespread this term is, that's new, but what it refers to is not new. Ben Porath, an expert on free speech and former chair of Penn's Committee on Open Expression, recently spoke with Penn Today about deplatforming, toppling statues, rescinding admissions, Twitter, the First Amendment, and hate speech. Just a little, little context here of uh, what we're talking about here. And uh, and then, well, why don't we get into another story? And this is really going to take us in the direction that I really, well, you got a little bit of the context here of what we're talking about. This is a story that we're going to be talking about. Hey, this is from law.com. About time or unconstitutional cancel culture. A move is on to have Connecticut judges adopt ABA Model Rule of Professional Conduct 8.4G, which would make harassing or discriminatory, and, and the, the harassing is not as noteworthy as the word discriminatory. Discriminatory behavior as an ethics of violation and ethics of violation it is probably long overdue but these proposed those proposing it had better be very cautious as the line between permissible and prohibited government regulation of speech is as thin as spider silk and in not only speech by existential really thought itself that's really fundamentally what we're what we're we're talking here now let's do a little bit of let's do what we do when we do these things just to see what the universe is telling us about what it is that we're we're, we're dealing with here let's go to our uh, google news search here and we can see cancel culture and free speech the real reason republicans are talking about cancel culture this is from refinery 29 it's clear that decrying cancel culture was a the theme of the night but why taking up the battle for free speech in place like Cal okay whatever uh, the new york times rnc presents donald trump the american protector protector this is a fight for freedom versus oppression Vox, RNC 2020. Daniel Cameron's speech makes Trump's pitch to black voters. Look at this. Look at this cancel culture and free speech. Look at this. This is Google News. And it's uh, 
left favor of cancer culture, New York Times favor of cancer culture, Vox favor of cancer. All of these, all of these are also not only are they favor to these have been fundamental drivers. Well, I don't know as much about. I know Refinery Twenty Nine is left. I don't know how how much they've actually engaged. But I know New York Times, Vox, and Washington Post. They've used their their platforms fundamentally to to advance the to legitimize. Uh, and give power to the whole cancel culture thing in the first place. In a lot of places, they're the ones, it's their articles that get the cancel cultureians up in arms in the first place. So they're, they're, they're every bit to blame for this whole cancel culture mentality. So, yeah, of course they're going to defend it, and then Google's going to put them at the top because Google is favoring this crap too. Uh, Pen today, free speech advocate discusses growing talk of quote cancel culture. That's kind of what we were talking about, or, or where we began with. CoinDesk, Jill Carlson, free speech versus cancel culture, reason for optimism. CoinDesk, I don't know. So there, you get some, you get a, a general sense of uh, what's going on here. And let me let me tell you, let me tell you the. You strip away all of the ideational, valuational, spookity bookities from everybody, and and what it really comes down to is this: morality police favor those with their source of power, their extension of power however that works whether it's an extension of the power that they have in other words they they can use their power to to extensively uh, in extension become influencers in these areas or it's their starting off being influencers in this area that gave them the power in the first place probably a mix of both but fundamentally if your coalition is the one that fundamentally controls the cultural centers the platforms that send out the message, the approved signals, then you tend to favor morality policing in one way, shape, or form. And when you are the party of not having that, and the more significantly disadvantaged you are in that field, the more that you will appeal to well, in America, our our counter to that is their appeal to the rule of law, due process, bill of rights. So we talk about free speech, and that's what that's our that's our king. If you were, if you felt like you were being wronged by by businesses en masse, like many of us do at this point, including Google here, then you would appeal to the king, and we don't have a king, and. The president is not a king and was never designed to be a king. Our king is the Bill of Rights, so we appeal to the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is ultimately appeal to government guns to uh, ultimately, possibly, come to our aid in some form. I don't know. Oh, oh, In essence, whenever you get involved in the government, you're looking for government guns to get involved. Because they will, because there's always going to be, the well, the larger, wide-reaching, the changes the government is affecting in the human life that it's governing, well, the more likely you're, you're going to cause human life, because there's always going to be at least a few people that are going to say, oh, hell's to the nose, I ain't doing this, you ain't going to have to, you ain't going to, you never taking me alive, Capaz! <laughs> King of the world! I mean, yeah. So, it's the people that control culture will control and favor the appeal to censorship, morality censorship, in essence, because that's what morality police do. Morality police censor Bill of Rights people. They protect even dangerous thought. That first and foremost dangerous thought, especially when they're the ones that are being called by the ones in power, the dangerous thought. That's usually how it works. It's why in the 80s it was almost the exact opposite and everybody wonders why. And it's, I know culturally, really, culturally speaking, the 80s was fundamentally what we would call, especially by today's standard, conservative. It was It was very liberalized. There was a lot of, it just, Listen, in the 80s, 
it was still we were still it took from the 80s to really the 2000s those periods of time where you really saw the fundamental shift until by the early 2000s the shift had already largely been made but it hadn't quite caught up to reality and i don't even know if the people who had this power early on fully understood the power that they have and then when you had china coming more and more online and you had this huge engine that that fed it even more oxygen it outside outside wealth outside wealth that you could bring in so you could you could produce a certain amount of huge blockbuster products to china because they could basically allow you to fuel everything else within and yeah you could see why that alliance could could and would and uh most likely has kind of kind of emerged but now we're getting to something a little bit more interesting when we're talking about connecticut uh, 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 and basically injecting these types of of standards and let me tell you fundamentally what the standard is the standard is it's not it's not due process it's not bill of rights it's not rule of law it is it is a check on your morality that you must it is assumed that you are totally embraced you have no no opinion of any group or individuals in any groups that is deemed as being negative and the approved groups and not not the unapproved groups that doesn't matter whatever they and this is the same it's the same story a billion zillion times told it's nothing new it's just just different players different labels whatever it's the same story that always goes through whenever you have any in any any circumstance in which you have a consolidation of the ability to create culture Whenever you have the ability to create culture, suddenly you have to find a way to shut the door behind you. That's essentially what we're seeing. There, there is nothing fundamentally ideational or whatnot about you that, but uh, to to inject that into our due process system itself to create a culture, and that's what you would do. You would create a culture of cancel culture, and that that's a culture of of the crime is basically the accusation itself and the accusation is only a crime if the one lobbying the accusation has the almost uh priest king priest queen priest other kind of status and that's what you have you have a, a, a priest king method of jurisprudence and you want to inject that type of priest king jurisprudence into the american courts because it will fundamentally undo all of these nasty impediments to your ability to assure that culture is is kept in the hands of the few. That's really what it comes down to. It's just we have new tools, new techniques, there's new variations, new clever new little semantic word games that we've invented to try to justify whatever horrors that we're justifying at the in the present iteration as we go through uh, just a period in, in human history that happens to involve a significantly larger aggregate than ever before, but still on the main. It's just, it's just an aggregate of humans who are going through this uh, period of time where the, the culture signals are fundamentally controlled by a very, very few number of individuals and whenever you have that you have this every time every time and believe you me if it was folks that were using the conservative vehicles of power that found themselves once again in this position or in the position right now that these dnc sjw kind of coalition folks find themselves in uh they would be doing it would be the exact reverse the DNC folks would be crying First Amendment, and the RNC folks would be crying, danger, danger, thought, danger, thought, danger, thought. Guaranteed. 
to guarantee. Danger thought is always subjective. Well, it's not subjective. It's not. And when I say subjective, when people say subjective, that doesn't mean it's relative or just whatever it says. No, it's subjective in the terms that uh, it is. It is objectively true within a framework of preference. And every but every faction, well, they have very different uh, frameworks of preference than one another and in some instances the uh, the frictions of the factions are well legitimate but even that legitimacy is based upon the limitations placed upon all of us by the overall structures that afford small numbers of individuals to have the capacity to to play with our minds and see what's what with what that's essentially what we're we are where we are Little, we're not even experiments, we're just amusements that hopefully will produce enough prosperity amongst ourselves and creativity and dynamism to uh, allow these Citadelians to continue to live the, the, the wonderful lives that they live. Thank you for engaging with this material episode. As you remember, your views, your suppositions do not make you subhuman, nor do they make you subhumanize others. No humans were harmed in the making of the show, and we extend no wish of harm on anyone who wasn't directly harmed or threatened to harm on this person, no matter how reprehensible we find your views. We will see you in the next Frico Talks, where Frico attempts to talk about the news without freaking out. And there you go, urgent cancel culture and free speech. The judges get judged. I thank you all for uh, joining us and watching us. And remember, you know, that little thing there may have said something. As long as you don't directly try to... I'm not trying to coerce against any of you. I'm not appealing to government or authority. I'm just appealing to, uh, you know... I don't even know. I'm not even appealing to anything. I'm appealing to my own preference. That's it. My preference for consensuality. For reasons of my own worthlessness. And yours too. We're all worthless. But the thing is, we're all worthless. Which means technically, none of us are worthless. Think about it.